His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. Amen. Thank you for being here. Welcome to Faith Chapel. Glad to see everyone here this, this beautiful day that the Lord has given us. Um, not too hot, not too cool. It's just a perfect day. And uh, we're so thankful for Him and His provision for us. Thankful that we have the opportunity to come together. So I wanted to welcome everyone here as we um, seek to praise our great God. So I have a few announcements for you this morning, and then we're going to go ahead and open the, uh, the service in prayer. Uh, first announcements I want to make is about the uh, Faith and Grace Garden. Um, crops are starting to grow, and it's starting to look great out there. Um, and uh, so we're excited about that. We could use a little bit of help, and so um, Monday, tomorrow evening, um, we wanted to do a little bit of weeding over there. It's not going to take a lot, um, but a little bit, and uh, many hands will make light work. So if you have time, um, if you would be able to come over and give us a hand, we'll meet over here. What time do you want to meet, Catherine? Five, six o'clock? Six o'clock. And uh, meet over here at the garden. We'll do a little bit of weeding, a little bit of watering, a little bit of fellowship, and uh, praising God for his goodness. And uh, so make sure that uh, you, you take that opportunity to be part of that. And uh, if you have any questions, see Catherine. Yes. There are also, if you need any motivation, there's also raspberries that need to be picked. So there's that. So if you don't want to weed, you can pick raspberries. So, all right. So a uh, little incentive. So make sure you come and be, be part of that. Um, wanted to give you a <laughs> great day for us to celebrate today as we look back just a couple days um, the Supreme Court's uh, decision. Uh, praise the Lord, amen? Um, overturning Roe v. Wade. Uh, praise God for that. I mean, who, who would have thought that day would have come? You know, many of us thought it'll never happen. And praise God, it did. And uh, we need to celebrate that great victory today. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, a little bit more about that later today. Um, but for now, we need to praise God for all that he uh, was able to do over these last number of years to bring that about. And uh, what a great victory to, to celebrate. I wanted to give you a, an update on Timothy, uh, Timmy, Timmy Adair. Um, we've been praying for some dear family friends of ours. Uh, Timmy's still, he's holding his own. He had a good day yesterday, and he was actually able to sit up for a little bit for a couple hours and visited with his siblings. First time he's been able to do that. Um, so that was a, a great praise, a, an answer to prayer for them to be able to see their, their little brother and for him to be able to see his siblings. They're, they're a large family, you know, and so they're used to having brothers, you know, and sisters and everyone around, and, and to not have that is, you know, uh, difficult for all of them. Uh, they're very close. But praise the Lord, he was able to do that. Um, still on the vent, and uh, still has some, some issues with stabilizing blood pressure and heart rate and breathing and all of those things. So they asked that we specifically pray um, that his blood pressure would stabilize and for his lungs, for his lungs and the muscles that he uses to breathe, that we all use to breathe, you know, things, muscles that we take for granted, that those muscles would strengthen and so that he would be able to breathe on his own and be able to come off the vent. So if you need something specific to pray for Timothy about, for little Timmy, pray that his lungs would strengthen, the muscles would strengthen, and he would be able to come off the vent and uh, that they can get things regulated for him. So continue to pray for Timmy and the entire Adair family. Um, they greatly appreciate that. So uh, with that, I think that's all I have. So let's go ahead and open the service in prayer. Father God, we, we come before you again grateful and thankful for just who you are, just the mighty God um, that you are, that you love and care for us, and, and you, you love and care for us so much that you sent your son to come and die for us in our place. We're so grateful for that free gift that we have. Because of that, we're able to gather together as like-minded believers to glorify your name, to sing songs of praise and worship to you and to your son and, and for all that you have done. 
We just pray as we come into this, this service that you would help us to just focus on you, that we would lay aside the distractions of our days and our lives at your, at your feet, trusting uh, you with them. We think specifically of, of little Timmy Adair, Father, that you, you would just continue to have your hand upon him. Father, heal him in a mighty way. You are the great physician. And Father, we know that you are more than able to heal every part of his body. And Father, we do pray that you would do that. Father, we trust you in that. And Father, we, we, we trust that you will glorify yourself in that difficult situation. But Father, we just pray again that you would help us to focus on you and what you have for us this morning. Father, that we would lay those burdens down for a while. Focus on what you have for us as we go into songs of... of singing songs of, of, of praise to you that they would come from just joyful hearts for who you are and all that you've done for us as we give back our, our gifts of money that we would recognize that all we have comes from you and we would just give that portion back that you would use it for your, your kingdom. Father, as we go into your word that your Holy Spirit would just guide and direct every, every word that I speak, Father, that our hearts and our minds would be open to exactly what you have for us and that we would leave here as changed people. We would go out to be salt and light into the world that you have put us in. We just pray that you would just glorify yourself in all things this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning. Let's stand together. Please open your hymnal to 147.
Please turn to 650. This hymn is the same tune as for a thousand tongues to sing, so you will recognize that right away, although the words might be new to you. Turn to 548.
be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your greatness and your goodness to us, Lord. Father, we want to continue to worship you with our tithes and offerings right now. Take these things from cheerful hearts, Lord. Multiply them and bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. Children may, di may be dismissed to Children's Church. Well, today we're more than halfway through this, uh, this study to the seven churches that we've been going through. And as we've talked about before, these are, are real letters. There's real letters, the real messages that Jesus wrote to real people in real churches, in real places. They were for the people that were there, but they were for us, for all those that have ears to listen to. So these, these messages are, are for you and for me and for the church today. We can see ourselves in each of these churches too, can't we? Can't we? I mean, if we read them, like I talked about last week, they're, it's like a mirror. We see ourselves, the same sins, the same attitudes. We've looked at the churches of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and Thyatira so far. Ephesus, the church that had lost its first love. Smyrna, the suffering church that received no rebuke from Jesus. They were doing things right. Pergamum, the compromising church. Thyatira, the, the tolerant church that tolerated sin and false teaching inside of it. 
Today we continue to look at our, at our uh, study, the Church of Sardis, the Church of Sardis, which is the dead church, a church that looked alive on the outside, but on the inside, they were dead. So a quick, a quick refresher, um, Sardis was about 30 miles south of uh, Thyatira, 50 miles east of Smyrna. It was built on top of a 1,500-foot tall Acropolis, smooth walls on three sides. It was almost impregnable. The city eventually outgrew that mountaintop, and it, and it grew down into the, the hillside below. The, the, the old city up there remained as a refuge in times of danger. However, in spite of how impregnable it was supposed to be, it was defeated twice because they were so, so overconfident. They fell asleep. Had quite a reputation for being a wealthy city. It was a, the ancient capital of the Lydian Empire. It was a first to mint silver and gold coins. The expression is rich as Croesus, uh, which means being filthy rich, refers to here, the king here, King Croesus. It wasn't a terrible, terribly religious city. Like many of its time, it worshipped Artemis. See if it works. There it is. The Temple of Artemis. Um, they started it. They never finished it. They started building that, that temple. It also had the largest synagogue of its time. There's another picture inside the synagogue. It's pretty big for its time. It was built right in the middle of the city. That will be an important fact here in a little bit. The church was probably founded as a result of Paul's time in Ephesus. We talked about that a little bit. That's, that's our little refresher. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail. I went into that last week. So let's go ahead and look at our letter, the letter Jesus wrote to this church in Sardis. It's Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Open your Bible. If you don't have one, should be one in the, the pew right in front of you, and it's on page 1312 of the pew Bible. So this is what the Lord Jesus says. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have a few, you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, last week we, we started our familiar outline that Jesus uses, the characteristic, or the author, the commendation, the good that is happening, the warning, the problem that he sees there in the church, the remedy, what needs to happen to correct it, and then the danger if they don't, and then the finally offers hope for those that overcome and are faithful to the end. So last week we looked at the author, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. It's how he wants them to see him, and it also gives us a glimpse of why he is writing. The seven spirits of God referred to the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We talked about that last week. He is the one, he is the one who, who sent the Holy Spirit to the church to bring about transformation in the lives of, of the people there. The seven stars are his messengers, or the, the pastors of each church, the leaders. Jesus is showing that he is sovereign over every aspect of his church, including its leaders. He depicts himself as the one who sovereignly works in his church through the Holy Spirit and godly leaders. We looked at the commendation the commendation, the good that was happening there. 
Well, there are no words of commendation to the believers at Sardis. He had no good words to say to them. They may have thought they were living, that they were an active church, but according to Christ, they were dead. There's no sense in talking to dead people. The warning. He says, I know, as with all the churches, the Lord declares, I know your works. Regardless of how spiritual we may think we are, he knows the truth. He knows the truth. And then he issues a warning about what he sees going on there. He said they were relying on reputation, relying on reputation. They had accomplished a great deal in the past. Now they were just kind of coasting. They were resting on those past successes with no desire to go forward. And that led to other problems. We looked at overconfidence. They began to believe the hype. They began to read their own press. They became overconfident in themselves. And that led to this impregnable city being defeated, defeated twice in humiliating fashion. They were caught sleeping. The enemy snuck in undetected. Their overconfidence led to laziness. They began to build a, a huge temple to the goddess Artemis. We talked about that. But they never completed it. They got lazy. Well, the church got lazy too. The church did the same thing. The fire went out of this church, its leaders, and then its members. And it appears that the church of Sardis never allowed the Holy Spirit to complete its work in them. We looked at the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers. Their laziness led to complacency. Their laziness led to complacency, and that's where we pick up today. So complacency is de defined as a self-satisfied state of negligence or carelessness, especially in relation to one's personal situation. When Jesus gave the, the message to the believers in Sardis, he rebuked them because they were not living up to their reputation. Sardis was a wealthy and secure city, but the church had become lethargic. They were unwilling to fulfill their Christian responsibilities. The church at Sardis had not had to endure the persecution that the other churches had faced. Most of the other churches we've talked about, they all face some kind of external pressure, persecution from the government or, or people or friends and neighbors. This church had none of that. They, had, they didn't have to make a choice. No hard choices about the religion to remain living in the city. The city accepted them. Planting and growing the church had gone really easy for them. They had grown quickly. They had all these programs going on. Other churches heard, and they wanted to be like that church too. They had a reputation as a church that was on fire. They'd grown content to rest on that reputation. His past works, they became complacent. One of the greatest dangers of the Christian life is complacency. It's one of the greatest dangers any Christian will face is becoming complacent. Contentment. Contentment in Christ is to be sought after and celebrated. Complacency in Christ, however, is a very, very different thing. Christian contentment means no matter what happens, you are fully satisfied in Jesus. Contentment. I'm fully satisfied. He has given me everything that I need. I need nothing else. Christian complacency means that no matter what happens, you're fully satisfied with your current personal effort. Well, I'm fine right here. This is as much Christianity as I need. I'm doing okay. This is good. I don't need to go that far. Right here is just, just enough Jesus. Complacency is dangerous for a Christian in at least three ways. Complacency, it means you're not growing. 
You're not growing. Wester's definition of the word complacency is a feeling of being satisfied with how things are and not wanting to try to make them better. Self-satisfaction, especially when accompanied by unawareness of actual dangers or deficiencies. Satisfied with how things are, not wanting to make them any better. This is good enough. That sounds like a pretty dangerous place for a Christian to be. The Bible makes clear that Christians are never, never standing still. They're either growing or they're backsliding. After listing some of the qualities every Christian should have, Peter says this in 2 Peter 1.8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful. In other words, if you're a Christian who is complacent with your growth in God, you are in danger. You're in danger of being ineffective and unfruitful. In danger of being indistinguishable from the world. It's a a superficial believer. The danger of complacency is that it causes us to live off our past victories like Sardis. Christians are to seek after Christ. And when 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 we do, he causes us to have victories in our life, right? Many of us here can speak of victories that Christ has given us in our lives over sin, addictions, attitudes, relationships, health, and finances. And that's wonderful, and we should rejoice in those victories that he has given us. The danger danger comes when we begin to rely on those past victories rather than on Christ. Well, I overcame it. I won that victory. I did it. Drinking, gave it up. Smoking, no problem. I laid them down. We have a breakthrough victory and we think that we're all set. I won. I won. No more worries. No more struggles. It's all good now. Wow, we won. That'll teach them. Let's go celebrate now. Did it. It's all good. While we should be looking ahead to the next battle, God wants us to win. We rest on that victory instead of moving on to the next one. Great! You defeated that city. You defeated that town. The enemy's still up there. Move forward. March on. No, let's sit back here. Let's enjoy our victory here. I know there's a battle on the front lines, but, you know, we took this little village. So often we can experience the power of God in our lives, and then we just assume, because he acted like that in the past, that he will do the same in the future. I don't even have to try. God will do it. I don't even have to do anything. We don't have to do anything. It it just happens. It just happens. It's like we sign up for some subscription service, you know. It just comes once a month. Don't even have to do anything. We begin to become comfortable in our faith in a bad way. We become complacent. When we think of the past and then no longer think of God in the present for the future, we don't work at it. And one of the most dangerous ways complacency It's dangerous for a Christian as it hinders the Christian's prayer life. No matter who you are, no matter what God has done through you, no matter what amazing ministry you have been part of before, you are only as powerful and as useful as your current prayer life. King David did amazing things before his sin with Bathsheba. He was anointed by God. He won many military victories. 
He had been a great king. The people loved him. But none of that prevented him from committing adultery. If you've been going to church for more than a few years, eventually you will hear about some Christian leader having a moral failure. There was one, there was one that came from this very church, a very famous Christian leader that came from right here. May outright, they may outright reject clear biblical teaching. A few weeks ago, I mentioned the singer Ray Bolts. Remember when I, I talked about the singer Ray Bolts? Amazing singer, wrote and sang these amazing gospel songs. Came out as homosexual. Completely rejected the truth of God's word that he had sang about for years. Now, does a, a failure negate all the good God did through them in the past? Does that failure negate everything that they did in the past? I even mentioned that with Ray, Ray Bolts. No, it doesn't necessarily have to, but it does prove that past pursuit of God will not sustain us through the present or into the future. Just because we had that victory in the past, just because we did an amazing thing before, that's not a guarantee that's going to keep us from stumbling in the future. You can't rest on that victory and say that because of that, I have no problems moving forward. Odds are before the, this moral failure that these leaders had, they first had a prayer failure due to their complacency in Christ. Yeah, I am good. I'm singing some amazing songs. I've built this huge church, written these books. People look up to me. We must seek God always continually, praying about everything at all times, even after prayers are answered or after we've experienced some great move of God through us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In all circumstances, not just when you're going through a hard time, but after you've won the victory, when you're getting ready to go into battle as you come out of battle, when you're in the midst of the battle, all times, all circumstances. Philippians 4, 6 through 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we spend time in prayer. So we spend time communing with Him. It's going to guard our minds. It's going to guard our hearts from allowing things to come in. Pride. Sin. It's easy to ignore those things when we're not talking with Him, not giving Him an opportunity to point those out in our life. Contentment in Christ is one of the main goals for the Christian. Complacency, however, is truly dangerous for the Christian. The only cure to complacency is a passionate pursuit of Jesus Christ, a passionate pursuit pursuit. Complacency and laziness typically go hand in hand. We often see, we often see this happens as Christians come, become complacent in their faith. They don't desire to grow in their faith. They don't walk in their convictions. They, they entertain a progressive biblical worldview. 
they become hesitant in their, their beliefs about God's, what God's Word says. Well, I don't know, I'm not sure. Is that what it says? They begin to compromise a bit. They start accepting the world's opinions about it. They stop sharing the good news of Jesus. Complacency has not only plagued many believers, it's, it's plagued the church for a long, long time. Churches fear calling out this sin and all the others because they don't want to make sinners upset. Well, they, might, they might stop giving. They might stop giving, and you know these lights... They don't pay for themselves. You can't step on their toes. They might stop coming. You know, if you make them feel too bad about themselves, they just won't come here, and then you'll never reach them for Jesus. Well, guess what? If you never reach them for Jesus with the truth, you're never going to reach them for Jesus. It's ridiculous because it's the church who is called to instruct the body the Word, to teach what it says. The full counsel, not just the parts that we like. See, the church, the church has gotten lazy, complacent. Thing is, too, most people, most people are not even spending time in the Word for themselves. For most people, Sunday morning, is when they pick that Bible up off the coffee table and they carry it into church. They look in the bulletin. What, what page? Open it up. Church is over. Carry it home. Right back on the coffee table. Know right where it's going to be next Sunday when I pick it back up to head back to church. They don't word the read the word for themselves because the, the, the church won't do it because they won't do it for themselves we see a culture of people claiming that Jesus is Lord but living a life that, that doesn't reflect any of its truth 2 Timothy 3.5 having a form of godliness but denying its power they claim it but they're not living it that laziness and that complacency had infected the church of Sardis. That complacency caused most of the church to soil their garments, Jesus says. Verse 4, Jesus says, You still have a few names that haven't gotten their white garments dirty. It says, A few have stayed clean. Well, you know what that means? It means that most of them didn't. Most of them did soil their garments. The idea of stained garments would have been familiar to them here in Sardis because of their, their wool dyeing industry that they had. Garments often symbolize character in Scripture. Isaiah 64 6 compares our sins to polluted garments. So, what does it mean to get your garments dirty? Think about you if you were wearing all white. If you walked in here with a, a shiny, brilliant white polyester leisure suit, walking around, just strutting it, right? At first, as you walk around in the world, you have to be real careful, right? It's all white. Got to be careful. Got to stay, that's, that, that's definitely dirty. I'm going to stay way away from that, right? You're real careful at first. But after a little while, you get kind of comfortable, you know. It's not too bad. It's okay. I can, I can handle it. And then, oh, wait a minute. How'd that get on there? How'd that happen? Pretty soon... Pretty soon you're dirty. How do you soil your garments? By brushing up against the world. 
being around it until eventually, eventually some of it's going to rub off on you. You can think you're doing well, but eventually you're going to let your guard down. You're going to get complacent. The next thing you know, a little smudge there. Oh, how did that happen? I don't even remember that. What would you get on your sleeve? What do you mean? What do I have on my sleeve? I don't know. You got it all down the back of you. What did you do? What did you get into? I don't know. I don't even remember sitting down. This can happen to us spiritually too. We start out good. We start out real well. We guard ourselves. Then we start getting overconfident. We get a little lazy and then complacent. We begin to accept a little bit of the world, you know, just a little at a time. I mean, you know, I mean, who am I to judge? You know, I mean, who am I to judge other people? You know, I can just barely take care of myself. Well, you need, to be, you need to not be so nitpicky, so legalistic. You know, we can just all get along. We just need to show them love. You need to be more loving. I don't know any church that was more complacent than this one. Remember that, that great big fancy synagogue that they built? Remember where they built it? Where did they build it? Right in town. Right in town. You say, oh, I, that's not so bad. That's not so bad. There's lots of churches in town, right? They built it right next to the Roman gymnasium in the bathhouse. If you know anything about the Roman gymnasiums and, and bathhouses, you know, you know the debauchery that was happening there in the open. They didn't even hide it. The Romans, they love the human body. They love the human body. They would do their games outside in the field, in the gymnasium, in the nude. All kinds of immoral things happened there openly. And then the Roman bathhouse, which was part of the gymnasium, man, all kinds of wickedness happened there. And they built their church right next door to it. That is the bathhouse. This is the church. Now before you say, oh, you know, they were just in the mission field. They are right there. So they could be right among the sinners, you know, so they, they could reach them, you know. How can you reach them unless you're there? See, there's another picture. There's the the field. Those columns are part of the field, and that right there, that's over the entrance into the church. The entrance into the church, right next to the field where they're running around in the nude. How would you feel about bringing your family to church if we had something like that going on right next door? They thought, no biggie. We're in the mission field. You know, we're going to be the light in that darkness. Well, go in the church. Inside the church, they had their names on the walls written in Greek. Remember, Jews took names very serious. It was part of their identity. Think about Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, right? What happened to them? Their, their names were taken from them. It's a way of humiliating them. Well, here they, they wrote their names in Greek. The mosaic tile floors and wall reliefs had animals important to Romans. Symbolism that the Romans 
thought were important. Huh. Statues. Even, see those statues there? That's the altar. Flanked by some animals that the Romans worshipped. And then, if you look on the side of the altar there, right there, the altar itself had a Roman eagle on it. This was a church in name only. Now, sure, they may have, been, may have been having services. They may have had programs going on. They were going through the motions. There was no life here. Spiritual life was gone. They had let the world into the church. Has the church today brought the world in to get along or to become relevant? Do you know of any churches that host the Easter bunny? Easter egg hunts. Come in and get your picture taken with Santa Claus. At the church? Two of, two of the largest Christian holidays, two of the most important events in Christianity that the pagan world co-opted and we bring that into the church? Well, we're just going to get them into the church and then and then after they get their picture taken, we're, we're going to give them a track. Maybe they'll come back for youth group. They use secular books, movies, and songs as sermon topics. It's not reaching out. That is not reaching out. It's complacency. It's compromise. And it's letting the world into the church. The church at Sardis was little more than a moral country club now. They weren't a threat to anyone. So they never received any persecution. It was filled with unregenerate pagans that looked good on the outside. Jesus sees through it all. He knows the danger that they're in. Jesus warns this church that if they don't wake up and repent, he will come like a thief in the night. Matthew 24, 42 through 44. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming... He would have stayed awake and would have not let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, this is not his second coming. That's a joyous occasion that we all anticipate. We look forward to his second coming. No, the picture of Jesus coming like a thief carries the, the idea of imminent judgment. Imminent judgment. The threat here is that the Lord would come and destroy the Sardis church if there's no revival. This is a warning of the danger for all dead churches and its leaders. And its leaders. See, because sometimes, sometimes it's the pastor's fault that the church has grown cold. He has not led them. But he's built a nice kingdom here. Big building. Lots of programs. He's writing books. Got a big worship band. Maybe they even start their own music label. Their own schools. Built a nice kingdom here. He put you here. He holds you in his hand, one of the seven stars. He could take you down too. He will come down. And he will come 
when you least expect it. Your lampstand will be taken away. You may be comfortable now, thinking things are just fine, like the city that felt safe and untouchable on that mountaintop. So confident that they went to sleep with the enemy below them, only to wake up to find out that they weren't untouchable. Instead, they were plundered and destroyed. The soldiers brought destruction. Jesus is going to bring punishment. But all was not lost. Aren't you thankful for that? All is not lost. He offered a remedy. He offered a remedy. We're going to look at that next week. How does a culture become so bad and twisted as Sardis? Or today? When Christians that are supposed to be salt and light become lazy and complacent. They begin to accept things of the world and not push back. Not only do they not push back, but they they even bring it into the church. Roles of men and women. Well, maybe, maybe the world has some valid points that we should look at. Let's, let's talk about this, you know? Let's evaluate that a little bit. And I mean, we are equal, right? So, so maybe, maybe that is outdated thinking. Premarital sex. I mean, I mean, come on, let's be serious. People are going to do it anyway. You can't really expect them to abstain. Homosexuality. Well, maybe you can't help who you love. You just need to accept people right where they're at. Abortion. Well, I mean, I don't personally believe in it, but, but, but who am I to force my beliefs on someone else? Pretty soon, the church no longer offers life. It's as dead as the world is supposed to be influencing. I'm not going to get political here, but I'm going to get a little spiritual. Today, we celebrate the Supreme Court decision we mentioned this morning, overturning Roe v. Wade. What a tremendous victory! What a tremendous victory we see that for protecting the unborn. Amen? Praise God. A gigantic step in reclaiming the sanctity of life. We should celebrate that amazing answer to prayer. Celebrate all the hard work that it took to get to this day. Tireless workers who volunteered at, at, at county fairs, handing out those brochures and setting up those stands. I was working in crisis pregnancy centers, the appointment of conservative judges, lawyers, and, and organizations that tirelessly advocated for this, the faithful prayers of God's people. We need to celebrate that. But don't you dare let your guard down. Don't you dare let your guard down. Don't you rest too comfortable yet. It's not over. Not by a long stretch. They're going to start looking for other ways in. They already are. Some of them already saw it coming and they start passing laws in in certain states, right? The battle just moves. Liberal states are are putting state laws in places. They're ginning up their people. They're fundraising. We need to elect people that are going to restore this right to kill babies. They're going to keep going and going and going and going and going. We must not become lazy and complacent. 
We must not rest on this victory as if it's all done. That Hey, we won! The God of this age has blinded them so that they cannot see. There's still a battle being waged out there. A battle for the souls of the people. Now we need to be involved in the politics and all this other stuff. But we need to be busy about changing the hearts of these people. So that they can see truth. We must learn the lesson of the dead church of Sardis. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up from your laziness and your complacency. Quit soiling your garments by by rubbing up with the world. Don't be a part of the world, and you better keep the world out of the church too. Don't fall asleep. Be vigilant. Be watchful. He may come at any time like a thief a night. Are you ready? Are you ready if he comes? Is he going to catch you at your post? Is he going to catch you at work? Are you going to be sleeping? Are you going to be napping? When he returns, I pray that he finds you faithful and watchful to continue the battle that we have in this world. That's the lesson that we need to learn in the church of Sardis. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. Humbled and repentful. Father, we, we hate to admit, but we see so much of ourselves in, in these churches. But you knew that. Lord Jesus, you know us all too well. You say, I know. You see right through every excuse and every every good thing that we try to prop up, to hide it. I pray that you would forgive us of our complacency. Not having that fervent fire to fight for truth, to keep moving forward, that we've gotten lazy and We've said, well, this is just enough Christianity for me and I don't need to go any further. But that's not what you've called us to. I pray that you would forgive us those areas where we have become complacent. I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would empower us and enable us to move forward boldly. as fearless soldiers in the battle for the souls of those who have been blinded by the enemy, the God of this age. Pray that you would help us to do this. The power of the Holy Spirit for your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. We're going to close with number 731 in the hymnal, if you'll stand together.
Make no mistake about it, we are in the midst of a spiritual battle. Whether you want to be or not, doesn't matter, because we are. You are a soldier in Christ's army. March onward, Christian soldier, for his glory. Amen? Thank you for coming.